Good morning. Can I just tell you how good you look to me this morning? I love my church family, and I'm so glad to be back with you today. In Psalm 9-1, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works, and I will be glad and rejoice in you, and I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Would you stand and sing with us, please? morning. It's good to see you today. That was a great job singing that song. You're right on time. Yes, I forgot her last sat Sunday, so I told her we got to come up here and have our act together today. Uh, that was a great job singing that song. Earlier service, the only person I heard singing was me. 
And that's kind of sad. The only complaint I would have now is we need more guys on the praise team, so turn Earl's mic way up. <laughs> I'm glad you're here today. We're going to have a great time together worshiping the Lord. Some announcements are coming your way. Um, yes, I asked Preacher Tracy to um, let me come up today because I do need candy, candy, candy. We are going to have a trunk or treat event, and uh, we just don't know what time exactly. So we may have a trunk or treat in the morning of the 31st or in the evening. we got to knock that down because Deb Tucker has been um, talking to me about putting it in the paper, and so I've got to make those decisions but I do know the town is going to have their regular trick-or-treat, and we are trying to be safe and COVID-friendly, so I want to make sure that we um, definitely have a drive through event. Uh, also, I think the Methodist Church across the way is also going to have some kind of drive through trunk-or-treat, so I'm super excited about that. And then before I forget, um, the kids worship kids. I'm going to take all of my kids today, even the older ones, uh, they have been wanting to come, and I think I have enough room to social distance them. So if you want to send your kids uh, after the praise songs, then we're going to do that. All right, hit it, Chris. So um, today, I actually am kind of like a sheep in wolf's clothing in the fact of that our wolf in sheep's clothing, um, because I am going to uh, celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month. So, I, <laughs> so October is uh, Pastor Appreciation Month around these parts. We usually do it in November because uh, uh, I'm in charge. So I'm actually on time and feeling so great about it. And so we want to take a few minutes to kind of love on our pastors. It has been a tough year, 2020. And I think all of us are ready for 2021. I've not ever said that, that I want to fast forward time, but wow, maybe. And they have kind of led us through what I would consider the world valley. You know, um, I say when you come into church, you should take your world coat off and put your Jesus coat on and leave it all behind. Um, because there's a big fat mess out there. And when we're together and we're with Jesus, wow, you know, nothing can keep us apart. And so they remind us of God's love every day. So as the slide says, we love our pastors, right? So let's give them a big round of applause. So, um, yeah, this is like stretched a little funky for me, but um, that does in there, uh, the colors didn't come over, but it does say Dr. Jamie. Thank you for giving us a pizza, your heart. Oh. <laughs> so in thinking about this, um, pizza is one of my favorites, right? It's one that I think when you get a really good pizza, it's made with the finest ingredients. And that's what you are made of, Jamie, the finest ingredients. And so if I was stirring up a recipe for the Jamie, this is what I would come up with. It would include two heaping cupsfuls of patience. Yeah, he's got to work with me, so like that's at least one cupful. Um, one heartful of love. Two handfuls of generosity. Even this morning, we got a text asking us to bring canned food goods to the food pantry that is low on food for our community. And so he was thinking about that this morning as he thinks about us all the time. He has one head full of understanding with more than to me, I think a dash is like individual, but I would put several dashes of laughter in there. He's always making you smile, always knowing when to um, laugh with you, and then he's willing to uh, put on a serious hat, too. Um, I would sprink that, sprinkle that generously with love for the Lord and add plenty of faith, and then I would mix that well, and that's what you get when you get the Jamie. If you spread it over nine years that he had given it to us, 
He's willing to share it with everyone, and we thank you for that, Jamie. So I told him I would keep, like, I told him that I was going to try to be on time a couple months ago, like, get this done. And he says, oh, I said, but I'll try not to cry. And he says, oh, go ahead and cry. And I, he might just let me cry here. I want to thank you for sharing your ministry, your family, your love of our Savior, and not only with the youth, but you share it with all of us. And I appreciate that. This year, to show you that we um, love you, we got you this perfect shirt to eat pizza in. Of course, you know, go ahead and show the picture because, goodness, it's on its way, but uh, the hurricane slowed it down. Um, <laughs> I hate when that happens. And since you can't survive on decide to give you a little dough. <laughs> Jamie, come up and let me love on you. Uh, Jamie, those are real pepperonis, so um, <laughs> the money might be getting greasy, so if you could just open it up and, like, take them off real quick, that'd be great. <laughs> My granddaughters thought I bought them the pepperoni, but really. Okay, Pastor Tracy, I want to thank you for taking a hike with us. I don't know if you know this about Pastor Tracy, but he loves to hike. He loves to take time to enjoy God's creation that he has given us. And two, when you came to First Baptist, you had entered retirement, and you were on a new journey. I'm sure you were excited. <laughs> and yet this quote came up, you and you embraced the detours. The detour was, honey, a past First Baptist church. And the new hike God had in store for you, you are willing to listen to him and to give your time and your heart and your love of the gospel to help First Baptist take their next step. We love you for that. Thank you. As you continue to enjoy this passion and to honor you, we bought you an annual National Parks Pass an annual South Carolina States Park Pass, and both of these will allow you and up to four guests free entries into any national and state park. And we got you this great, well, I think it's great. I don't know. You know, probably, we probably got the wrong thing, but <laughs> here's a hiking backpack for you, of course, and one of these. Happy appreci Pastor Appreciation, we love you. Well, thank you. I had no idea. North Face, I've never owned a North Face bag before. Let me transition back into this now. Um, I'm reading from Psalm 33. Can we just do that? I'll tell you guys I love you too. I appreciate the opportunity to serve here. Uh, it's been a great blessing and a great joy for me. Uh, in fact, one of the greatest blessings of my entire ministry. And, um, you guys are easy to preach to. Um, so far, anyway, what do you hear this morning's message? Psalm 33, listen to God's word. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. 
He is faithful in all that he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Now jumping to verse 20. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our heart rejoices. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord. Even as we put our hope in you. You know how uncertain the times are these days. Melanie mentioned 2020. You see the memes all the time about the crazy year that we have had. I am so thankful that we have a God, we have a Savior who's got it all under control. And His unfailing love sustains us through everything. Don't get your focus on the junk out there. Just focus on the Lord's Word and on His presence in your life. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Let's pray. Father, today we dedicate this time, this service to you. We thank you that you have made sure that we were here this morning. Don't let us miss the fact that you set this all up, that you have purpose and intention and you have a, a will that you are exercising to perform in our lives and in our midst here. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for giving us your word that we might have a, a strong and sure foundation to lead us day by day. I pray that we would know your presence here. And I don't just pray that for this morning in a worship service. I pray that this church would be anointed in the power and the name of Jesus. I pray that we would understand everything you call and intend for us to do. And then we would do it. We would obey. We would follow you with every bit of strength that we have. And we would see and know that you are with us and that you are working for your glory. Do it here in this time. Do it in the days ahead in the life of this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we worship the Lord together, this is our song of the month. And it is Graves into Gardens. And I would wish you would pay close attention to the words of this song. Because I can testify personally that I've had a grave that God Almighty turned into a garden. And he can do the same for you. Let's sing together. I search the world.
is God alone. Don't sit down. We got another song. <laughs> you are God alone. Sing it out. You notice in this verse that the first verse is a little G. And in the second verse, it's a capital G for our mighty God. Sing it. Here we go. Yeah, we're not done. <laughs> you are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal. morning. This is a great looking crowd. Um, my wife told me not to talk before I sang, but I'm afraid that ain't going to happen either. Um, we need more singers. As you notice, we don't have special singers every Sunday. This is a talented group of people, and we need you to contact anybody and say, look, I'm willing to sing, uh, preferably Sheila, but you need to sing, okay? And I know we got Chicken Man and the Wing Nuts. You all need to sing a little bit more often. <laughs> um, but anyway, this song is entitled Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. A cleft is a very, very deep schasm 
or a, an indention in the very foundation of life. And God will make that for you. And he will create a refuge there. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the They would. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. We're picking up in this next chapter. It is a transition point beginning with the triumphal entry, the final week of Jesus' life. We're about seven days out from the, even the resurrection now at this point. So this is where we are studying. In this chapter, there are several things happening. Um, they are very significant, very 
bold statements just because it is the last week. It's the final teaching this chapter and the next two right before Jesus is um, the Lord's Supper and then arrest and so forth, cross, burial, resurrection. So there's a lot here. Um, it, it's, uh, it's heightened in its significance, I think, very clearly as uh, at the timing, the location that it falls in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so that's where we are. In Hot Springs, Arkansas, you'll find the Morris Antique Mall. Nothing on the inside of it distinguishes it from any other antique store. We know what antique stores are. We know how they smell, that musty odor. We know that you see all the artifacts and the old pieces of this, this and that, the, the bric-a-brac that you'll find in an antique store. Very common. But when you go on the outside of the building and you look at this building, it is not common. It's actually very obvious. It used to be a church. It used to be a church, and now it is an antique mall. Now, I'm sure when they built it, nobody ever said, let's build a church so that it can become an antique mall. I'm sure the pastor in that church, when it was a church, never once proclaimed the vision of this place is to store worn-out artifacts. You wouldn't have heard a sermon on when we all become antiques, uh, though there might be various applications for a sermon like that. Yet now the building is lifeless. It is a tribute to the past, and it is a warning to the future. A tribute to the past, a warning to the future. When I read Mark chapter 11, I think this is a chapter of warning. It's a chapter where Jesus is so intent about his mission now that every little nugget of every little event has, has some powerful application to who we are as Christians, to what we are doing as a church. And so that's the direction I want to take the chapter. These are ten mistakes that churches make. We're beginning uh, in the first verse of Mark 11. Let's read there about the triumphal entry. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, tell him the Lord has need of it and will send it back shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the triumphal entry. If anything, this is a statement about worship. And it's a statement to us as a warning. We make some mistakes when it comes to worship, or we're at least highly susceptible to those mistakes. So number one on my list, worship becomes dull ship. This is a mistake many churches make. Worship becomes dull ship. When we read the triumphal entry, it is exuberant, joyful worship. It is powerful. It is a visible public expression. There is lots of excitement. There's lots of energy. People in, are involved physically. They're not sitting down on the side of the road watching this thing happen from a distance. They're not at a concert. They're not being entertained. They are involved. They are shouting. They are expressing their joy and their excitement. I want to know where we've got the idea that the chief indicator of God's presence was calm quiet reverence. Now I'm not saying reverence is bad. Obviously scripture teaches reverence again and again. But somehow I think too many times we've gotten this out of balance. 
we've gotten a little warped in the way we understand it. If you consider in your own life the way God has made us, our emotions surge within us. We love to get excited about things. We love to see something that builds energy, that puts a smile, that gives you great enthusiasm. We love to be where that's happening and to participate in it. And I'm also confused because when I look around, I see a lost world that's crying out for meaningful excitement, for something that really is worth getting excited about. And the Bible gives clear evidence for energetic worship for passion in the worship service and the church says oh no worship must be reverent must be reverent when all along sometimes we don't really mean reverent we just mean dull sleepy calm restrained manageable comfortable like an old bedroom shoe. You guys got old bedroom shoes? You know that thing smells kind of bad. It's worn out, but it still sits there. And when your feet get cold, you stick your feet right back in it. And that's the only job it has, just to give you a little bit of warmth sitting there on the floor. Too many times the message in worship services, restrain yourself, calm down, relax. Everything's going to be okay. I don't see worship much like that in Scripture. Look at Psalm 33. We read it earlier. I've got the verse, uh, verse 3 on the screen. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully. Relax and sing quietly and calmly. Is, it, I see your eyebrows raised. Good. That's not what this verse says. Shout for joy. How much shouting have you done lately for the joy of the Lord? Now we'll shout at anything else, right? We'll shout at Joe Biden or Donald Trump when something happens that's not how we think it ought to be. We'll shout at the confounded media and the liberal elites and all these categories we've come up with. We'll shout at our football games. We might shout at one another about something that's happened. How much shouting for joy to the Lord do you do? It's a tragedy the way we have allowed worship to, to lean way over in the direction that it is. It is fitting and appropriate, the writer of, the, of Psalm 33 says. Worship with all you've got. Engage your heart, your mind, your passions. Do it with some energy and some enthusiasm. We make a serious mistake when we allow worship just to lean over to the side of restraint and calmness and peace. Here's another one, number two. We wind up making a mistake when churches offer the wrong Jesus. This really happens. In fact, it's something we have to all be careful about in our own understanding of who Jesus is, what his, his goal, his purpose is. I'm still in the triumphal entry, and here in this event, they shouted Hosanna to the Son of David. They are worshiping the Messiah, but they don't have a clue who this Messiah is. They have allowed themselves to be sold a bill of goods from the religious leaders of the day, and they expected the Messiah was going to be a political superhero who was going to come sit on the throne and solve everybody's problems and bring in the final kingdom and make life just cozy and wonderful for everybody. That's not who Jesus was. That's not what he came to do at that point, and that's not what he's come to do even now in our lives. That is a promise for the future someday. But that's not the first step, the first phase of the Messiah. So we've got to understand the risks. See, we have a lot of problems today in making sure people understand who Jesus really is. Because there's a lot of people who do a lot of talking about Jesus. They just often can be confused about the true Jesus. He is not the good luck charm in the sky. He won't iron out all of your difficulties and give you a million dollars. Shucks. I understand, but it's the truth. He's not there to simply make you feel better. That's not what his mission is. He didn't come to make all your problems go away. In fact, we often hear the warning in Scripture that if you give your life to Jesus, you're inviting more problems in. You're opening yourself up for more difficulty. See, this world has this idea about stability and calmness and how everything's supposed to go. This world can't ever find any of that. But then you come along, you say you love Jesus, and they look at your life and they're going, oh, 
that's not the Jesus we want. That's the Jesus that stirs things up, that brings a little risk and danger, that asks us to do things that require a whole lot of faith. And we wind up not understanding that to follow Jesus is to put ourselves in difficult categories sometimes. Consider John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. This is Jesus promising peace. And then he said this though, in this world you will have trouble. I'm pretty sure we're all still in this world, right? We're still in this world. Peace is a heart condition. The world's on the outside and we live in this environment. In this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. That'll really put a damper on the Jesus wants me to be rich and prosperous theology, which is not found in the Bible anywhere. Jesus said, you need to put your faith in me and I will help you and sustain you and do wonderful, incredible things in your life. But he never said, you'll never have difficulty if you do that. You'll have more difficulty if you serve the Lord. That message needs to be what we proclaim to people. Here is the real Jesus. Let's go to the third one. Number three, verses 15 through 19 now. Jesus is clearing the temple. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area. He began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have turned it into a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this. They began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So here is this teaching, this expression that Jesus gives on what should be going on, on what the attitude and idea should be in the life of the church about money. Money. The mistake we make often is we wind up looking at money as for personal profit. Here's how this works out now. Everybody's supposed to come to the temple and make particular offering sacrifices at particular points throughout the year. You have people scattered all over the nation, some of them coming far away. Some of them are very limited in their means and capabilities. Their wagon's not big enough or they don't have the equipment to bring the animals for the sacrifice. And so, of course, we need to help these people. And wouldn't it be great for us to line up all the animals and we can take that little corner in the temple right over there and we can make sure these animals are of the quality necessary for the sacrifice. They had to be the best, spotless, pure. We had to be able to provide for these animals and feed them and take care of them and we're giving our time to all of this and so the next step in that process becomes oh yeah temple real estate is pretty expensive too and we have a certain skill level and expertise in providing these animals so of course we need to be paid and after this began for a while it became we need to be paid even more and then it became hey these people have to buy animals and you know if we told them that the only certified animals were the ones sold in the temple then they have to buy our animals which means since these are the only certified animals we can charge a number one premium prices so show up and get your premium animal and leave your premium denarii right on the table. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. This is how this went and it became clear to Jesus before he even got there. This is usury. This is robbery. That's why he uses the phrase den of thieves. They have taken what God intended for the highest ideal and turned it into the worst possible ideal all about the money it's a simple little racket now here's the danger in churches today in america you'll find some of the richest places in our country i know there are churches struggling with small budgets and real challenges but there are some churches many churches with big budgets and lots of money it becomes very easy to get the wrong attitude about all the money why does God give money to a church for ministry, for the evangelism of lost people, for the needs of struggling, hurting people? Yes, I know we have to pay the bills. 
Praise God, we have to pay the pastor. I'll say amen to that. I understand that. Yes, yes, we send the kids to camp. Yes, we put gas in the van. Yes, we have to pay the electric bill. All of those things. The budget is great. Thank God for blessing and working to provide for those needs. But we're always in danger for seeing money the wrong way. We're always in danger of wanting to lock our arms around the money and say, look how the Lord has blessed our church. We better make sure that we protect it and preserve it. We better make sure that nobody else gets their hands on it. We better make sure that we don't spend it for something that's not, you know, the most exact perfect thing that we're supposed to spend it for. It's a dangerous territory, folks. In fact, I would say to you, every penny that we have, God gave it to us, right? And every penny that we have, God gave it to us for His purposes, for His intention. And when we don't use it for that, guess what happens? God finds somebody else who will use it for that. That's exactly what happens. And so we get into real danger where a church winds up sitting on its pile of cash, hoarding the money and thinking that it's blessed and the church is not doing the thing it's supposed to be doing. We must never forget that our calling is to do ministry. And the money is the tool to do the ministry. And the focus has to work just like that. There's another thing taking place here in the triumphal entry, verses 15 through 19. It's number four on the list. Don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. Just imagine the uproar that Jesus caused the day that he cleared the temple. They were in their normal practices. They were following their order of surface. Everybody knew how all of this went. They knew where the lines were. They knew what they were supposed to say. They're all going through the motions of the practices. And here comes Jesus. They all knew who Jesus was. They knew Jesus came at most things from a different angle. They were very intrigued and curious about who Jesus was and what he was trying to get to. There were some who hated him already. As it says, when he cleared the temple, they began looking for a way to kill him. Jesus, in that environment, said, we've got to do something about this. The other, trans, uh, the other gospels even tell us that Jesus made a whip. I would think a man who'd been a carpenter most of his life could make a pretty mean whip. He takes that whip, he goes into the den of thieves, the marketplace in the temple, and he scatters the whole thing. Do you think Jesus was a little upset? You better believe he was. This is righteous indignation. I would say his face is red. I'd say the, the sweat's pouring off. I'd say he might have even raised his voice just a little bit. And stirred up this situation. What does this mean for us today? Look at the way we do church today. We all have it all figured out. We know how everything's supposed to work. We know who's supposed to do what. We know how we're supposed to dress on Sunday morning. We know we've got a little piece of paper with an order of service that tells us exactly what's going to happen. I wonder sometimes if the Holy Spirit started rearranging the order of service, if we might not say... Oh, calm down there, Holy Spirit. Don't rock the boat. See, we think everything's supposed to just be calm and placid. It's supposed to go the way we pretty much have already determined. But when God gets involved in a thing, it never goes the way we have determined. You can't tell God how He's supposed to do anything. Anything. Whether it is the way we function as a church or what's going on in your life or what you're dealing with. Now it's okay to say, hey God, I don't understand this. Or hey God, I thought this would be this. And he'll work with you on that. But still, his agenda rises to the top. His will is what supersedes any thought that you and I have. I long for the day when things could go in such a way that something could happen and we would say, wow! God showed up in the place and He did a thing. Boy, I was never expecting that. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't it be amazing? Many times when we have all of our structure and all of our orderliness and everything just like we want it to be, I wonder if it's not so much a sign of the presence of God as it is a sign that we're all asleep and nobody really even cares. 
right? How many times? We're all asleep. So let me ask you this question. It's a yes and a no answer. I understand that. Is peace and calm a sign of God's presence or more an indicator of our apathy? Which is it? We really have to examine and understand our hearts when it comes to that. Let's move on. Number five. It's right out of verse 17. That one statement Jesus made. He taught them saying, it is, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? You have made it a den of thieves. It is written in the Old Testament, Isaiah 56, verse 7 to be exact. And when Jesus spoke this verse from memory, it became written in the New Testament too. In the Isaiah passage, it says that the temple becomes the gathering in place for all of God's people. It becomes the symbol of the presence of the locality and the availability of God. So we want God in our lives. He's in Jerusalem representing himself there. That was what the temple stood for. The New Testament, though, expands greatly on the idea of the temple. The New Testament expands greatly on the idea of the temple and makes it pretty obvious that God had something much greater in mind than just a building in a city somewhere, one place. In fact, you know where the temple is now, right? You know what the New Testament says about the temple? Look at 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And God's Spirit lives in you. You yourself are God's temple. So think of this. Jesus said, my house, my temple, the temple, shall become a house of prayer. And we know as it's taught later in the New Testament, as it says here in 1 Corinthians 3, the house now, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, is right inside our hearts. So what does that mean about our own lives? What does that mean about our own bodies and our own minds? Wouldn't it stand to reason, just logical deduction here, that our lives now are the representative of the house of prayer? The house of prayer. What that is telling me is a simple affirmation of the, the importance, the significance of your relationship with the Lord. I know you've heard the teaching before. You've been in prayer seminars or prayer sermons or read prayer books. The, the ultimate meaning behind prayer is that is your daily walk in communication with God. It's not your going to Him when you need something or when you have a problem or somebody else needs some help. It is your constant communication with Him. And so your prayer life becomes more than just what you do in a minute or two in the morning or what we do in a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. Your prayer life becomes the, the measure, the thermostat on your whole relationship with Jesus. So I'm dealing with situations day by day. I need the Lord's help day by day. I'm dealing with this problem that shows up at 9 o'clock, this person that shows up at 11.30, this thing when I get home at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. All of these things. I need help. I need wisdom. I need direction. I need strength. I just need to know what God would have me do. How does God get that through to me? It's my constant prayer life. My, my house is a house of prayer. The Lord lives in me and I live for Him. And so I'm always seeking direction. I'm always paying attention for marching orders and for truth and for clarity and for help. Even when it's just, oh God, help! I'm fulfilling this particular aspect of how important the relationship is is listen to what John Bunyan said. He's a great Puritan writer. Hundreds of years ago, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Some of you have heard of that, perhaps read it. Real prayer is a serious concern, for we are speaking to the sovereign Lord of all the universe who is willing to move heaven and earth in answer to sincere and reasonable prayer. Prayer is not a mechanical duty, but a wonderful opportunity to develop a loving and caring relationship with the most important person in our lives. He gets it, doesn't he? written hundreds of years ago, hasn't changed a bit. The most important person in our lives 
prayer is what produces the importance of that relationship. So we're always striving to be the house of prayer. That's number five. Then we get to number six. I want to read the text and then tell you what I see going on here. Verse 12. Notice this is before the cleansing of the temple and after the cleansing of the temple we get the conclusion of this episode with the fig tree. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went out to find if it had any fruit. When a tree has leaf on it, the tree is indicating that it will be in fruit. So he went out to get the fruit. He found no fruit on it. And because it was not seasoned for figs, even though it had already leafed out prematurely, he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now jump to verse 20. In the morning after they were leaving, that they went along and saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered, withered. Now understand, the fig tree Jesus looked at had leaves on it, which is an indicator of fruit. And Jesus went to the tree to see the fruit, but there was no fruit. Please understand too, in the middle of this, we get the cleansing of the temple. It's put together this way on purpose. Jesus first gives us the illustration of fruitlessness. Then he goes into the temple. What does he find? Fruitlessness fruitlessness and so he curses the fig tree and then he curses the activity taking place in the temple and then we get the final teaching of what that's all about so what is the mistake it's a very serious one we wind up priding fruit inspecting above fruit bearing fruit inspecting above fruit bearing this is a very dangerous issue in too many churches and in too many Christians because it seems like we've developed this uncanny ability to pay far greater attention to what's going on in other people's lives than we do in our own lives. Is that not right? We wind up looking at how other people act and what other people do. We are experts at finding the weakness, the shortcoming, the problem, the stumble, the failure. And we can pick it out. In so many other people's situations. Isn't it amazing? Because you guys got weaknesses too. And you got shortcomings. And you stumble sometimes. And you're probably pretty familiar with what failure looks like too. Every single one of us. How in the world can we spend all of our time trying to see what's wrong with everybody else? You know what that is? That's just a tool of the devil to tear churches apart. And he uses it powerfully in too many places. Powerfully. It makes us resent one another. It makes us think we're better than somebody else, which is nothing but old, nasty pride. And it's a destroying force in many churches. Jesus is looking at you. He's not leading you to look at somebody else. You remember what he said to us? Get that beam out of your eye before you're worried about the speck in somebody else's. That's your huge problem that's visible to everybody. What qualifies us then to go worry about somebody else's problem at that point? Deal with your own problem. I want to tell you something. The gospel is supposed to do something powerfully in your life. It's supposed to have massive change effect in your life. And so when you say, I believe that, I want that, I surrender to that, that invites Jesus to come take a look at you. He's looking for fruit. He's trying to prod you to produce fruit. He's calling you to do something for His name and His glory. You have the responsibility to do it. Let me just say this too. I'll go a step further. What about churches? How many churches do we really need? Question? How many churches do we really need? Do you know in Anderson County, the Saluda Baptist Association has 84 Southern Baptist churches? There are probably just that many other churches of other denominations. 
that say they're evangelical and they believe God's word. All of these churches, they have full calendars, impressive facilities, large budgets. They have so many people involved in so much stuff. And that's pretty much just what it is. Stuff. Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? How are we serving the Lord to reach lost people? How are we bringing the power of the Spirit to bear in people's problems, in our own problems, in the challenges of our day? How do we share the gospel on Facebook rather than the garbage on Facebook? Can I get a witness? You understand what I'm talking about. Where is the fruit? It puts me in fear of Revelation 3, the church at Sardis. The Lord said this to them, I know your deeds you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. But you are dead. It would be a worthwhile spiritual undertaking for you to look at your church. Not everybody else's place in it, but your place in it. For you to look at your life before the Lord and say, okay, God, how am I getting this right? Where is my fruit? What am I doing to make a difference in the kingdom? Show me. Show me. And do the business with Him you need to do over that. Help me change me. Ask Him to do that, would you? Ask Him to do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank You. As Your Word speaks to us, we ask that You would you'd highlight exactly what needs to be addressed in our lives. We pray for the church collectively, the one true church. We pray for your intervention and power and you would raise the church up to be everything you mean for it to be. We pray for this church. We pray that even with all our successes and all our comforts, that you would move us forward to make a difference, to impact this community and the world around us and Lord, we pray for each of us individually in the church. We have a role. You've called us to a place and to a purpose. So work that out to accomplish what you mean to accomplish. Bring it to pass, God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as a time of response this morning. If you need to come, I invite you to come publicly. You can come to the altar and pray. Come and speak to me. If not, even as you are where you are, would you talk to the Lord? Talk to Him about where you fit in what we've talked about. Talk to Him about what He's trying to challenge you with. How do I need to change? What do I need to understand better about myself? Ask Him. He'll show you. Let's stand together and sing. You, you may be seated. Uh, we're going to enter into a, a time with our pulpit committee. Uh, and, of course, if you need to leave, you'd like to leave, that's fine. If you're a guest, you're invited to stay, certainly. Uh, but we understand people have things going on. The pulpit committee is coming. We're, we're killing our live feed, Sam. We're okay with that. And uh, we have questions that have been submitted. And then uh, if you have questions from the floor you would like to ask, they will address those. Uh, also, they'll go over the schedule for next week and everything that's uh, coming ahead of us. So we'll hear from our committee. Thank you, Pastor Tracy. It's great to see you all over this morning. 
What we're gonna do is run through the questions that we went over last week, as well as a few new ones that came in over the week, and then answer any others you may have. So I'll begin with, what's your view of discipleship? How would you see a discipleship program being implemented at our church? His answer, my approach to discipleship is as follows. It starts with the pastor setting the example. I believe that a pastor should constantly be pouring into one to three individuals on an intimate spiritual level. I've been mentoring men for greater ministry roles for roughly 16 years. Discipleship making, in my view, is, a great, is the Great Commission and starts before a person is saved. I believe we should do discipleship the way that Jesus discipled Peter, James, and John. I would lead this by example and train others, other leaders of the church, to do the same. That's the short answer. I can go into more detail of how I do that in person. A book that I highly recommend and have used as a personal model is the book Growing Up by Robbie Galati. I've been highly influenced by his discipleship philosophy. Next question, what is your experience in a building program? In my 30 years at my current church, we have had four building programs. Three of those I have been involved with in various ways. I served on the building committee for two of those building programs and I've been a part of the most recent building program as pastor on staff. The biggest issues in a building program are usually church harmony, unexpected change orders during the building process, and permit building code issues. Three elements are crucial to a successful building program. First, prayer to seek the will of God. Second is a good plan to get the project complete. Third is a selfless and humble congregation that seeks to please God and to serve others. If those three elements are present, the job will get done and God will be pleased. Next question, what does he expect from us in addition to our attendance? Prayer, support, patience, tithing, and attendance. What changes are you bringing to Honey Path First Baptist? I want to learn people, earn their trust, get people in our house, get to know people and staff. What version of the Bible does he preach from? Mainly from the King James Version. He also uses the modern English Standard Version and English Standard Version. Next two questions, will Tracy Alvester stay on as assistant pastor and why isn't Tracy being considered? You heard Tracy's heart last week as he told you how he responded to God through prayer and he's being obedient to God and with through his name. Next question, I see the total salary base. What is the total package? Total compensation is 100,422. Has he ever served as a senior pastor? No. Has he only served in one church? Yes, as associate pastor for over 13 years. How many in attendance at his church? Current membership, 1,700, and in COVID, they're averaging 400. Is his father the senior pastor where he is now? Yes, he is. Do you have any experience with Celebrate Recovery or similar programs? Our church had a Celebrate Recovery program for several years. I'm familiar and think it is an awesome ministry of importance. I have not run it, but I have popped in to meet people on the program. I fully support those involved and would fully support it as pastor. What do you see as your role with that ministry, meaning CR? My role in the ministry is to shepherd the leaders and support them with whatever they need. How do you foresee your role with different age groups in the church? I would love and spiritually nurture each group as best I can. I would also be available to the leaders of different ministries to help nurture them also. How do you interact with various groups? Make time to get to know them and be available as much as I can. I would also host different groups of the church in my home to build relationships spiritually and to spiritually advise them as needed. What does Dr. Phillips feel about small groups outside the church to study together and serve the Lord together? I fully support small groups at home as long as they are organized to be effective and theologically accurate. If they are led by the spiritually, by spiritually solid and organized group leaders, I'm all in. With that, what questions from the floor? Chicken's calling, so you better speak up. <laughs> All right, Boomer.
And I think the answer, I think the answer would be seeking God's will, Boomy. It was we left it open for God to direct, and then we followed Him through prayer and fasting, and came up with the best candidate as we felt God led us to. But yes, everybody was considered. Anything else on that? Kurt, did you hear that question? Pastor Iverson will remain as part-time interim. That's to be determined. And be going back to you.
Jamie, I'm going to go back to your question just a little bit. Um, I was thinking as you, you're asking the question, um, you know, we wanted to open up the process um, for a pastor to see, you know, what kind of availability was out there for us. Um, so first, the first thing we did as a committee, we ran it through the Baptist Courier. Um, I don't know, two to three months, Mason, uh, we ran an ad through the Baptist Courier. We got about 64, 63 resumes. Um, so we just didn't want to limit ourselves, uh, you know, um, as a committee. We thought the church uh, wanted us to, to look what was out there. Um, so we had 63 resumes all the way from, I know we had several in Texas, Massachusetts, Michigan, uh, Arkansas, long way off. Um, so, so we looked at every resume uh, and, you know, the ones we really liked, we kept to the next process. Uh, the ones we thought were questions, you know, we weeded out along the way. And I think our first culling was 14, I think, if I'm not, if I'm mistaken. I think the first process was 14. And then down to nine. And then down to five. And then out of those five, we gave three face-to-face -face interviews. Um, so that's where we were as a committee, and that's the process we took. I can there address it. search committee. I <laughs> well, on, on principle, I mean, he's, I mean, he's already accepted what we've the the the, uh, the he's accepted the calling in the uh, uh, the financial package altogether. He's accepted that. Um, he's just waiting on if the church has called him with the vote. So I think that's where we're at. Uh, we're just waiting on him to come in, Josh to come in, and give that trial sermon. And then the church will determine whether he's called or not. But uh, he's already accepted the call if the church is willing to accept him as their pastor. Okay, I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, Real quick, I hope everyone got their update on the calendar and the schedule of events. Next week is a next weekend's a very very busy weekend. It starts Saturday morning with an eight o'clock breakfast for the uh, active deacons, the trustees, and the chairman of the committees, and your brides, uh, spouses. We need for you to sign up on that. Um, you can call the office or call or sign up on the back bulletin board. Also on Saturday, the events. Uh, for the children, start at 10 o'clock, run through noon. There's going to be pizza, an ice cream truck. There's going to be Fantastic. There's going to be other games. Melanie continues to come up with ideas, so you know that thought process is continuing to move rapidly. Uh, also, there's going to be a game. We're going to have a big screen uh, out in the back. We're going to watch the Clemson game. I know if you folks aren't Clemson fans, we understand but you need to get your lives right. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to say that. Okay. Uh, and then also uh, at, uh, at 3.30, we also have uh, the teens who are meeting with the pastor. There's going to be snacks. And yeah, this is a good time for the teens and their parents to come and meet the pastor, meet, meet his bride, and just ask those hard questions that may be on your heart and mind and get to know them a little bit better. At 5 o'clock, we're going to do the pumpkin carving. It's going to be socially distanced. This is a big event in our church. We're really looking forward to that. And then at 6 o'clock, that's going to go from 5 to 6. And at 6.30, we have hot dogs. So it's a big weekend, a lot of opportunities for everybody to come out. I uh, just want to say this. Uh, I counted this morning. Today's our largest attendance we've had since COVID. There's 185 folks here today. So that's great. So um, in, invite, your, invite your friends, the deacons, call your families, invite those folks who aren't, who aren't coming. And the last thing is uh, next week, Sunday morning, three opportunities to vote, 8.30 service, 10.30 service, 
And if you don't come to, if you're still not attending, tell those folks. They can listen in or watch on the uh, social media, but they can listen in on channel 88.9 FM, and they can hear the sermon. We'll have ballots out back so they can vote. So we want to give the church the greatest opportunity, the widest, uh, the most capability we can for you to vote. So we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a great time, and y'all continue to pray for Kirk. Allison, it's good to see you back where you belong. She's a coronavirus survivor now, as is Sheila. She's back there. We're excited that they are here. Would you close us in prayer this morning, please?